Hi, I'm Dave Whitehead, Chief Executive Officer at Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. Today, I'm here with Dr. Ed Schweitzer, our President, Founder, Chief Technology Officer, and Chairman of the Board. And we're going to discuss starting a company, growing a business, and the culture that goes behind it. Hi, Ed. Hello, Dave. So by anybody's measure, SEL is a phenomenal success. And looking back 36 years, would you have guessed where we're at? More importantly, what was the spark or the idea that prompted you to start SEL? Well, I had no clue that we would ever be serving the electric power industry worldwide the way that we do it today. No clue whatsoever. What was the spark? It was a, an interest to see if uh, the ideas I had had at a gradu as a graduate student, that I could somehow put them into the products that, uh, well, people would try and use and benefit from. And that was really the, the spark, was a thesis and the uh, dream about seeing if we could really make it work and be better than what people were doing before. So you sold the first product in 1984, started the company in 1982. But really, as you, as you mentioned, the, the work or the genesis for the company came from your, your PhD thesis when you were uh, working on microprocessor-based relays. And, and while you were working on it, did you ever think that it was uh, a possibility or a probability that you could start a company from your PhD thesis and, and turn it into to what it is today, or even just start a company? Well, I knew it was a possibility. I never thought it was a probability. And really what it was was curiosity. That's, that's interesting. Did, maybe I, I can ask a, a, a similar, similar question. Did, did you think while you were writing it or finishing it up or, or, or defending your thesis that, that gosh, I, I might turn this into a company one day? Because there was a lag between when you graduated um, from, from WSU and before you, you, you started the company. Yeah, there was... 77 when I got the PhD and uh, seven years later when uh, we shipped the first product. And uh, even when I was writing the thesis, I thought that there was a very, very bright future for the technology. And it's one thing to have, during a uh, PhD thesis, you know, I was testing, ide having ideas, working on the theory of them, then actually you know, seeing if I could make them work in hardware and firmware. And, uh, well, the, the pieces were all there, and it was time to uh, keep doing better and better and better <clears throat> in some subsequent research projects and then uh, finally figuring out how to uh, commercialize it for the first few products. So it wasn't uh, as if in 1982 you rolled out of bed and said, you know what, today I'm starting a company. Yeah, and this afternoon I'll ship the first product. No. <laughs> it was just that easy, huh? <laughs> Uh, well, you made the decision uh, to, to start a business, but I don't recall you having an MBA or being a, a, prof a business professional in any uh, classical sense. How did you know what to do and what steps did you take to, to actually start a business? Well, I still don't have an MBA and I'm not so sure anybody had ever, has ever called me a business professional. <laughs> and what has driven us is doing business the way our moms would want us to, uh, fulfilling customers' needs and uh, being honest and open and making sure we, we get it right. Um, and really knowing that if we're going to succeed, the best way is to invent the future, come up with something new that's really better, cheaper, faster, simpler than uh, 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 what was before. That, that, that's great. Um, and certainly back in, in 1982 there, I'm sure there were at least one or two ways you could have started a business. There are probably a, a, a 20 or 30 different ways to start a business today from bootstrapping, just saving your money and, and paying as you go, you know, incremental versus seeking out a bunch of venture capitalist money. Do you have any advice for someone who's thinking about starting a business? Cause there's certainly many ways to do it. Well, I thought about them all of borrowing money or selling equity and I remember asking a friend of mine one time, I'm thinking about starting a business, what should I do? And he said, save your money. And for some reason that really resonated. Then I realized if I started small, started doing some consulting, saving money, trying things, coming up with a basic, simple product that people would uh, buy and try, that I could 
uh, bootstrap the business without giving up any ownership. That was probably a, a great way to start SEL, especially in the, the business we're in, where utilities are a little bit conservative, right? So they want to test out the technology. Uh, bootstrapping a lot allowed you to test out new ideas, one maybe not one by one, but certainly in a, in a smaller fashion than shipping a thousand units in one afternoon and hoping you got everything everything right on the first the first time. Well, that's right. Uh, Otter Tail Power Company bought the first three units not for protection but for uh, locating faults. So that was fortunate <clears throat> because um, there was nothing else out there to do that. So they did. They bought them because there was really no other good way to uh, locate faults. And uh, uh, they and we and other people began to get experience with the technology that way. And in the process, we uh, made the relays better and better and better. And uh, uh, also the fault locating got a lot better too. Uh, And it did evolve. And if we had gone out and to go back to your example and uh, oh, I don't know chased a big order for a thousand units right off the bat I think we would have failed wow the the first relay you you produced was just the the SEL 21 and it had some really cool technology especially for when it when it hit the market which is important when you start any business you want to have a great product to to sell to your customers but when you released it did you have a formal business plan or some some roadmap on on where you wanted to take the company in the next Six months, year, five years? Nope, no business plan. It was pay as you go, feel your way forward, uh, learn right alongside our customers and the industry, and uh, uh, innovate, innovate, innovate. I, I've, I've had the opportunity to visit a lot of our customers, and they've, they've all had a, a, a wonderful long-term uh, relationship with you. And that, that's one thing that, that many of them told me about you, especially in, in, in the early days when you were making a lot of calls and, and working with customers to apply the technology. I thought you were going to say when I was making a lot of mistakes. No, okay, I, thank you. <laughs> is, is, is the partnership, right? Especially the, the things you were doing, trying to take this new microprocessor-based technology, applying it to a – a very traditional um, um, conservative I- I- industry. How par- important was the the relationship? We talk now about things like business to business, or you know, a database that handles sending out mass mailing. How how important is a relationship with a customer, or is it just about volume and and uh, shipping product out to, to to potential customers? Well, this is really people to people. That business to business thing is a oh I disfavor the term because it's so impersonal, and I think about people that say at BC Hydro, Charlie Henville and Carl Engelhart and many others, who how patient they were to be able to explain what they wanted, what they needed, and then I think they found us patient uh, listeners, and we were able to do that. And there were some ideas like uh, the negative sequence uh, uh, time over uh, current elements that Ahmed El Nawahi uh, at uh, BC Hydro said, yeah, you can put it in the relay, but I don't think we'll ever use it. And then after some time, he became intrigued with the idea because we showed how you could speed up the coordination and get more sensitivity and so forth. So this working together where they would, these uh, guys, uh, Jules Estragalios at BPA, Bill Cook, San Diego Gas Electric, many, many other uh, folks around the country and around the world with Vision Federal, Electricity Dot, other places, that we just kept learning and learning, and so did they. I, I believe BC Hyder wrote a really good negative sequence paper for WPRC, didn't they? Ahmed did. Yeah. Yeah. He went from, but he needed to prove it to himself. And by golly, he did. Yeah. And, you know, in the process of proving it to himself, he um, helped us understand it even better ourselves, too. And this is really going hand in hand forward with our customers. That's one thing I've, I've, I've noticed about this business, working really closely with your customers, because we have some great ideas and they have some great ideas. And combining the the, the two mm-hmm. is is so important to to doing what we do to protect well, power systems. That's a good point. I've liked to I've liked to explain over the years that 
when a customer comes and asks us, hey, can you make this? He or she is expressing their need in the idiom of their experience. And we're listening to that in the idiom of our experience. And if we look at that as a union of experience instead of an intersection of experience, we're bound to uh, do better than we or the customer could ever imagine all on our own. You've done some things that I believe typical business folks would consider perhaps, well, unconventional. For example, you describe how, oh, excuse me. Could you describe how you came up with the SCL product warranty and why it makes good business sense? Well, at first our warranty was, there was no warranty. And pretty soon somebody said, write down what our warranty is. I said, okay, it's five years, no questions asked. And in practice, I forget, I think we started there and it went to 10 years. And, and, but in any case, the practice has always been to, uh, really, it's a unlimited warranty that if uh, a, uh, we will fix or repair, our practice has been to date to, that we've fixed, repaired, replaced anything that uh, uh, went wrong for free. And we get to the root cause of every one of the problems. Uh, we try to do it within 72 hours. We picked up on that because uh, I was visiting uh, one of the utilities labs and there was a relay from uh, somebody else taking a part on the bench. And I said, hey, what's wrong with that? And uh, they said, well, it's got a bad power supply. And I said, hmm, what's their warranty? And the person snapped back at me a little bit and says, who the heck cares what their warranty is? Uh, uh, it'll take them so doggone long to fix it. So the light went on in my head, wow, can we make such a simple thing a major differentiator? If a customer does have a problem, that uh, we make sure that uh, we solve it promptly. And if we can't uh, solve it promptly, get to the root cause, turn a problem off, turn a problem off, make sure we got it. Then we replace the unit so that we make sure that our customers don't don't get stuck with a bad unit and a repair bill on top of it, insult and injury. So what's, what's worse than sending a product back for repair when you've had a problem with it, only for the manufacturer to send it back to you with a label on it that says, no problem found, it's out of warranty, that'll be 500 bucks. So now what do you got? You got an invoice, a bad relay, an empty hole in a panel, and... Uh, well, maybe a kind of a crummy feeling in your stomach. So we want to make sure everybody's happy and that the, the equipment that we are making is serving our industry well. And if we can't get to the root problem and uh, 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 with the customer, uh, well, we'll replace the unit, no question asked. Yeah, that's uh, certainly amazing. A lot of warranties you deal with, it's, oh, yeah, the, the product or perhaps the service is under warranty unless the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, right? It's some of those, mm -hmm. those things. And you, you, Ooh, you've been... I remember <laughs> another thing from those days, Dave, is I had visited some company and had walked... They didn't make protective relays, but I'd, you know, so they made something else. And they showed me their um, repair department. And uh, they explained how that was a profit center for them. They had all kinds of equipment in there. And and I thought, wow, is that a dumb idea to to be to for a company to, company to be profiting on the misery that they caused their customers. It's just wrong. I wonder what message that sends to an engineer that defects are okay because we'll make it up on the back end. Or yeah. maybe I intentionally put defects into a product. It's just the yeah. wrong customer focus. Well, I mean, some people think that there's products developed with planned obsolescence and and that's not our our philosophy you know, these relays are sort of like rivets that get you know nailed into a bridge you know that's going to be holding together the infrastructure for uh generation years and years maybe decades uh, sometimes generations to come you gotta a, get it right and 
this is what I've always really been impressed the way you, you, you set up the business in that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, it's do business the way your mother would want you to do it. The measures or, or how we go about setting up a warranty, for example, is really with a customer focus, not for our, our balance sheet focus. And those are some of the, the external things. Um, turning it around a little bit, though, there, there's similar things internally. Um, one of these is what I'll call another unconventional business um, practice you've put in place is uh, the concept of Friday lunch. And, and what that is, is every Friday, the, the company gets together to learn, you know, various divisions report on what's happening at the company, or it'll get up, or I'll get up and, and talk about uh, what, what's going on, just to keep everybody informed of the good things and the bad things that, that, that have happened over, over the, the past week. What is it, and why did you start Friday lunch? And with over 5,200 employees around the world, does this still make sense to continue? I think it makes more sense than ever. When you have uh, five employees, it's pretty easy for everybody to stay on the same page. Everybody gets around the table for a. <clears throat> everyone gets around the table for a lunch, and they're the same people that are working within earshot and eyeshot of one another, and it's pretty easy. But with five thousand people uh, spread across the country and around the world, it's harder. It's more important than ever that we all share in the big picture of quality, of uh, performance, of uh, the very human nature of what we do, that we are selling um, peace of mind and confidence and knowing that when things go wrong with the electrical power system, that uh, it will be selectively affected uh, with the least amount of uh, damage and customers being affected. So that's what we do. And we have to be talking about that over and over again so that people can see how everyone's work, whether I'm designing equipment or building the equipment or fixing equipment or ordering parts or laying out a circuit board or, or uh, selling or designing it into an engineering service project, whatever it is I'm doing, uh, writing a brochure, preparing a presentation, uh, going to see a customer, teaching an SEL university course, is whatever I am doing, I need the big picture in order to really get it. That's great. In 1994, you converted SEL into an employee stock ownership plan or an ESOP uh, company. And today, SEL is 100% employee-owned. What was the thinking behind that business decision? Well... Kind of going back to the beginning with the uh, entrepreneurial thing, where I really wanted to keep ownership of the company, that of course over time that does need to change. But the uh, beautiful thing about ownership, it's the difference between owning your house and renting a house, is it's, it's uh, truly yours. It's your responsibility and your, uh, something to enjoy and benefit from. So in that same way, that uh, we're owning our jobs, not renting our jobs. It's really a part of all of us. And who better to own it than uh, we, the people at SEL, who are actually doing the work? It's a uh, certainly a tremendous benefit. It, I, I think it dry, uh, drives a lot of our, our customer-focused behavior uh, to wake up every day to, to delight customers, right? And, and this is, when I do that, that, that directly impacts my retirement plan and, and, and the rest of the company. It's, it's truly an amazing uh, way to structure a, a company. So on behalf of the employee owners, I'd like to say thank you one more time for, for that. It's a dream come true, Dave. Well, Ed, it, it's been a great conversation uh, talking about starting a business, though I recognize you've, uh, or you told us you never took an MBA or you never got your MBA or took your MBA classes, I'd, I'd love it if you wrote a book on, on how to start a business, maybe call it doing business the way your mother would want you to do it or something like that. What a great idea. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Ed, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. We appreciate it. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.